Hi, uh, I'm Anna Sternschus, uh, and uh, welcome to our afternoon's lecture. Uh, I am extremely excited to welcome our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Ada Rappaport Albert. She is um, uh, uh, Marvin and Sharon Gersten Distinguished Visiting Professor here at the Ann Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. This program brings the leading scholars in Jewish studies from around the world. This is the third uh, uh, professorship that uh, we have and we are very, very excited to welcome Professor Rappaport Aldler here. Uh, it's your first time speaking at the University of Toronto, right? Doesn't count, doesn't count. We're going to say it's uh, the first time and talk and uh, give us uh, two lectures on the, uh, on history of the uh, Has Hasidism and uh, Lubavitch Hasidism, um, a topic that once again we hear so rarely about here at the university and we are really looking forward to learning from your expertise. Uh, so Professor Rappaport Adler is a Professor Emerita of Jewish History uh, at the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies at the University College London, where she's been tenured since 1976. She's held appointments at the Oxford University Oriental Institute, Harvard Divinity School, and Hebrew uh, University's Institute for Advanced Studies, and many others. Uh, now, her CV is very long, so I'm not giving a lecture on your biography, but I will mention that she did write extensively on history of Hasidism and uh, uh, gender and Jewish tradition. Her, some of her books include Hasidic studies, essays in history and gender, studies in Hasidism, Sabbatanism and gender, uh, uh, female bodies, male souls, asketism, mysticism, and gender and Jewish tradition, just to give you a few examples. Um, and her lecture series will address uh, uh, the topic of history of the Lubavitcher Hasidism, more or less, right? So today she will speak about the 20th century emergence of modern Chabad Lubavitch Hasidim. And uh, uh, please uh, save the date on your calendar for Wednesday, the day after tomorrow. Then she will talk also here in this room at 4 o'clock uh, about the integrity of the female body in the rabbinical tradition. Uh, please help me welcoming Professor Robert Bordel. Well, thank you, Anna. Thank you for this warm welcome. I'm honored to be here. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, and uh, without wasting any more time, because I tend to go over, <laughs> let me start. Um, a brief word. My title is uh, 20th Century Emergence of Modern Chabad Lubavitch Hasidism. And um, I would give you a, just a very brief sketch of Chabad Lubavitch, why it's called Chabad Lubavitch. Uh, the movement began, it's one of the earliest uh, schools of Hasidism, uh, began at the end, in the end of the 18th century, probably emerging around the figure of Schneur Zalman of Ladi, the founder, uh, who becomes the dominant figure in his region, uh, I would say in the 1780s, from the 1780s on. The region is what the Jews call Rysen, and it is a territory that encompasses uh, what we now uh, call Lithuania and Belarus. Uh, so it is the, the northeastern provinces of the Jewish Pale of Settlement, which became the Jewish Pale of Settlement in uh, the Tsarist uh, uh, Russia uh, of the, from the final partitions of Poland at the end of the 18th century throughout the 19th century. And Chabad uh, is not only one of the oldest schools of Hasidism, but it is also one of the most stable ones. Uh, it has had a dynasty of charismatic leaders, Rebbeim or Sadikim, as they're called in Hebrew, uh, which directly descends from Rav Shinoz Zalman, not always necessarily father and son, but almost, uh, right down to the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, who died in 1994. Uh, what I would be presenting to you is what I see as the transformation of Chabad, which I think begins in the very beginning, at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, and focusing in particular on one period in the interwar period, the 1920s and 30s, right up to 1940, uh, during the leadership of the penultimate Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Yosef Itzhak Schneerson, 
who I believe, and I would try to persuade you, is the one who actually transforms Chabad in a way that can explain virtually every feature, including the most controversial and sensational features of contemporary Chabad Lubavitch. Uh, and the three areas that I will focus on are as follows. One is the position of women, uh, an area which, as you would have learned from Anna's introduction, I have dealt with in other contexts as well, and it interests me a great deal. Whether a change in the attitude to women is in itself a mark of modernity is a question worth probing, and I won't go into it. But I am seeing it as a response, the, the change in the position of women within Chabad, a response to modernity, a response to secularization, a response to processes that we normally associate with modernity, although it's a problematic issue. The second area, uh, which again is characteristic of Chabad and very controversial about Chabad, certainly within the orthodox uh, and ultra-orthodox sector in particular, uh, who are very critical of their position regarding women and are also very critical of their position in regard to outreach. They are very well known for their missionary activities, for proselytizing other Jews, not non-Jews, but very intensive outreach agenda. And the third issue is, of course, the most explosive of them all, Messianism. The Messianism of the last Rebbe was uh, the focus of so much controversy and is to this day a very dividing and divisive issue within Chabad itself. So these are the three areas that I shall focus on, trying to pinpoint the changes that mark the beginning of the reinvention, as I would call it, of Chabad in the modern era. Okay, so women first. Um, the context of <coughs> the wider context of the position of women in Hasidism I've written about many years ago, and although there's been some response to what I've written and some modification of it, in principle I remain firm in my view uh, that basically until the 20th century, and in the 20th century in a very limited way and most conspicuously in Chabad, women effectively are not part of Hasidism. Hasidism is a movement for men. There's been a tradition in popular literature, in belletristic and journalistic publicistic literature of the interwar period to celebrate the apparent egalitarian agenda of Hasidism. In an article I wrote decades ago, I tried to uh, trace this tendency to a particular historian, Shmuel Abhorodetsky, who published an article at the very beginning of the 20th century in Russian, a little article, and eventually a book in Hebrew in the 1920s, in which he celebrated what to him seemed like the egalitarian agenda, the gender egalitarian agenda of Hasidism. For the first time in Judaism, women are given full access to literature, scholarship, position of leadership, and uh, um, a, a much more uh, prominent position within the community and the family. And one by one, I try to demolish these claims, which I trace back to his own Zionist uh, pursuit of, a, of an authentic Jewish precedent for what he really advocated passionately. And he was somebody who had been exposed to the, uh, to the admittedly feminist trends within Zionism, which were there, never fully realized, but very present right from the start, uh, he read it into his sources. The one case which became very celebrated, and some of you would know of it, is the case of the Maid of Ludmir, a woman who was celebrated uh, in that popular literature stemming from his own original observations as a Hasidic female leader, a uh, female rebel, you know, a revolution. And to me, my reading of her story is very much a story of a failure. It's the exception that proves the rule. She is actually suppressed by the male leadership of her time, to the extent that she's a historical figure, which I believe she was, although the evidence about her historicity is very scant and very problematic. But probably she existed. Probably there were other such women, I would imagine. To me, what is so significant is not so much whether such women did emerge or try to emerge and at grassroots level maybe had a following. But the tradition, the literary tradition of Hasidism wipes them out completely. And very significantly to the extent that it begins to take account of them, it is reading scholarship 
that stems from Horodetsky in the 20th century and internalizing it. But it has no tradition of its own about this. Okay, so that's my sense about Hasidism generally. I can even offer you uh, a wonderful internal piece of evidence uh, which I owe to uh, Marcin Wojcicki, uh, a colleague from Wroclaw, uh, who has worked on Polish sources about the history of Hasidism in the 19th century. Uh, one document he has published first, by now it's available in his book on Hasidism in politics, uh, an interrogation of a Hasidic leader in central Poland, in the Kingdom of Poland of the 19th century, this is 18, 1824, a Hasidic leader, mayor of Opatov, uh, who is summoned to a commission of inquiry instigated by the Ministry of Religious Affairs in response to probably denunciations by Maskilim, enlightened, modernizing Jews who were very hostile to Hasidism, who had accused him of subversive sectarian activity. And he is interrogated and, in fact, eventually released. But one of the questions posed to him uh, it goes as follows. If a woman accompanied by her son, who is married to a man who is not a Hasid, who is not a member of the Hasidic movement, comes to you and expresses a wish to join you, would you admit her? And his response, which when Martin gave it to me, I kind of thanked him for giving me this as a little present. He simply said, women are not Hasidim. You know, so women's connection to Hasidism during the whole of this period, from the beginning of Hasidism in the middle of the 18th century until, I would say, Chabad in the 20th century, and in some respects in other groups now too, the, the, the connection was entirely vicarious. They were, it was a genealogical connection. They were born into families that had a tradition of being affiliated with a particular Hasidic leader or another, or they married somebody who was. But for all intents and purposes, they had very little to do with the Hasidic, the life of the Hasidic community. They were excluded from the occasions, in principle, always, from the occasions when the Hasidic Rebbe delivered his sermons, his teaching to his male Hasidim. They were apparently present in the Hasidic courts, which were a magnet for pilgrimage by the Hasidim. And there are contradictory testimonies about this, most of them polemical and hostile, uh, arguing on the one hand, that Hasidism is such a, this is Maskilim in particular, this is such a, an irrational, uh, regressive, uh, uh, primitive, uh, ignorant movement that it's good only for women and madmen. And so women are coming. That's who goes to the Hasidic Rebbe, just women. On the other hand, the same people also criticize Hasidism for breaking the Jewish family by taking the men away from their wives and children on their frequent privileges to the courts where they stay sometimes for weeks, sometimes for months, abandoning their families to fend for themselves in conditions of uh, uh, economic hardship and so on. And what my impression is, is that there were women coming to the court, but significantly they come ad hoc as individuals. They don't have a framework for women in the court. They don't exist as a collective entity. They don't form a constituency. They come because they want to see the rebel. Very often, some Hasidic rebels apparently would receive them and give them a blessing, which is what a rebel does. Uh, some of them would not directly deal with them, so they would go to his wife or to his daughter-in-law, to one of the women in the immediate household of the Rebbe, sometimes waiting for weeks for the opportunity to see, to be seen and deliver her request for a blessing. But they did not have a collective identity as Hasidim. The beautiful statements about this, some of them I think authentic, uh, about women who uh, well, I'll, I'll leave this now. This is the general background. Now, Chabad, as far as I can tell, historically, from the beginning, from late 18th century on, are not an exception in any way in this respect. Women in Chabad are affiliated to Chabad in just the same limited way, precarious way, vicarious way, as women in other Hasidic courts. There's even some evidence, <coughs> or at least some suggestive evidence, that the founder of Chabad, Shno Zaman himself, and follow him, following him, all his successes in the dynasty, uh, right up to the last one uh, of the 19th century, uh, would have no, in principle, would have no dealings directly with women. There, there's evidence that one can read into 
a reluctance or a complete refusal to deal directly with women from the fact that Shneur Zalman of Ladi, at a certain, he was a very successful Hasidic leader who managed to attract quite a lot of followers. And at some point, he felt he could no longer cope with the large numbers of people coming to the small town where he was and tried to regulate the, the number of visits that each type of Hasid may come to see him or may come to the court to participate in a celebration on Shabbat or on a festival. So he produces uh, what is known as the Takanot Lojna. He is still based in the town of Lojna. It's before he moved to Ladi. The ordinances of Lojna, which specify distinct classes of Hasidim. So Hasidim who have been with me for many years, right from the beginning. Those who have joined only recently. Those who live within a certain radius from the town. Those, so the different types, classes of Hasidim specified, each with a prescribed number of visits permitted. Significantly, women are not mentioned. They're not a class. They're not, which confirms my impression that there wasn't. A, uh, and in addition, there is in the very late collections of stories that Chabad begins to produce prolifically from the interwar period on. Uh, and in a, and a very few slightly earlier ones, late 19th century, or rather memoirs by people who were encouraged to write during the interwar period and who were recalling their years of being affiliated with the Chabad court in Lubavitch in the late 19th century. So some memoirist writings and a lot of late Hasidic tales about the history of Chabad, about the great leaders of Chabad, all of them, all of them tell us that each of the Hasidic uh, Chabad leaders in turn during his reign, in the phrase is almost the same time and again, would have nothing to do, would have no dealings with women. And normally I'm very suspicious of these late stories. They're very anachronistic. I've written about this, trying to show that much of this is part of the recreation of Chabad, the reinvention of Chabad. I suspect them a priori. But in this case, I'm inclined to accept them as more credible because they so blatantly go against the agenda of the time of their production. Normally, they try to read back modern developments and claim that they begin much earlier. Here, they are being written at a time when the status of women does become an important issue in Chabad. And the two rebels I'm considering in this case, the sixth and the last one, who are particularly involved in this, are very keen to mobilize women and to uh, bring them actively into membership of Hasidism, of Chabad Hasidism. And yet these stories project the opposite view. They say they would have nothing about all their predecessors. So perhaps they're credible. So historically, I would say until the 20th century, Chabad has very little to contribute to the picture of Hasidism generally as far as, far as the position of women is concerned. But um, the change begins, and I tried to suggest, and I hope convincingly in something I wrote, that the foundations may have been laid as early as the very beginning of the 20th century, before the First war World War. <coughs> and I identified an initiative by the wife of the then reigning Rebbe, Rashab Shalom Dov Bel, that is the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, the wife, Sterna Sara, uh, issues an appeal to women. She founds an association, a women's, a ladies' association for the support of the poor students at the Lubavitch Yeshiva, Tomchait Mimim, uh, in the lower classes of them. She issues uh, an appeal in Yiddish to the women of Chabad, to the wives and daughters of the Hasidim throughout what by that time is a fairly dispersed Chabad diaspora, not just in the immediate en environment of the Lubavitch court, but all over the uh, Russian Empire and beyond. Uh, we know the reach of her appeal because she published in, first in 1911 and again more fully in 1912 a list of all the donors she received, donations, names, and there are 179 names of women who gave money 
with the sum of money they gave and the purpose for which it was used. And you can see that they are scattered very widely. There are even some from the United States, although very few, uh, some from Prussia, uh, some from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, although the vast majority are from the Russian Empire, but by no means exclusively from Reisen, from the, terri the traditional territory of Chabad. So this, the very foundation of this ladies' association is a very modern thing, unique at this point in the Hasidic movement, modeled quite clearly on what had already been happening some 50 years at least earlier, if not more, in Russia, and even longer before that in the West, and that is the, the emergence of a kind of a, an upper Jewish bourgeoisie that becomes involved in philanthropy in much the same way as the non-Jewish bourgeoisie is. And in Russia, in Tsarist Russia, already at this time, outside of Hasidism, there are some prominent families of very successful industrialists uh, who are establishing women's philanthropic societies for this and for that, all kinds of charity, charitable causes. Nothing of the sort in Hasidism until this initiative of Shternasar. And by appealing to all the women of Chabad, she is implicitly imagining a constituency. There are all these women who are connected in some way for the first time. But I must say that the cause for which the money was being raised was a traditional male cause. It was to support the yeshiva, Tom Chait Mimim, which her husband, Shalom Dov Ber, founded in 1897 um, as a militant statement against all the things that he was combating. He was a very combative uh, leader who um, was out to, uh, to resist the encroachment of all kinds of political ideologies, modern secular political ideologies, above all Zionism, but also socialism, also all kinds of other uh, attractions that were drawing away from the Chabad fold, and in fact from the Orthodox sector altogether, the brightest and the, of the young generation. Uh, the yeshiva he founded was meant, on the one hand, to train a cadre of elite young boys, tr brilliant scholars, who would then go out into the world and spread, first of all, uh, fight for the preservation of strict Orthodox Jewish practice in the spirit of Chabad. It was to be the kind of the vanguard of Chabad for a very reactionary cause to preserve the tradition against the threats surrounding it, of which he was very aware, particularly Zionism. He had a real uh, fight uh, with Zionism as a false messianic uh, vision. We shall come to this in the last point uh, when we talk about messianism. So I better hurry up with the women. <laughs> he, uh, the, uh, he, in fact, was quite negative in his evaluation of women. From quite a few of his letters, it is obvious that he blamed women for introducing the heresy of secularism into uh, Hasidic homes. He shakes his finger at women. He uses very strong uh, language that comes from traditional rabbinic sources, very misogynist comments. Uh, women, uh, as we know, are, are much more susceptible to the temptation of Satan. Satan came and cast his filth in them. Uh, and they are the ones who are bringing in the secular teachers to their home. They want their children to learn the language of the state. They want to, they, they are the ones who started the problem. So he has no particular interest in women as such, but his wife initiates his position. Following him, I have to skip quickly to his successor, uh, the Rayatz, Yosef Itzhak Schneelso, the, the sixth Lubavitch Rebbe, who takes over uh, uh, when his father dies in 1920. By that time, uh, he has been through not only the uh, collapse of the Tsarist uh, Empire and the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, the First World War, uh, intensive you know, internal migration, immigration abroad, Jewish tremendous movement of Jews all over. He is witnessing a period in which the traditional world into which he was still born uh, in 1882, uh, 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 crumbling, disappearing. I mean, I'm so sorry if I'm not audible enough. Um, he embarks on a, uh, uh, where well, he, he is a campaigner for the preservation of Orthodox Judaism in post-revolutionary Russia, persecuted by Stalin, 
uh, imprisoned several times, exiled, eventually gets out in uh, 1927, settles temporarily in Riga, and eventually moves to Poland uh, in 1933, uh, first in Warsaw and then in a small resort town not far from it, Otswalsk. So he gets out, uh, but uh, he leaves behind the bulk of his following. He was a leader of a large Hasidic school, completely dominant in the region in which he was and beyond, who suddenly is forced to abandon most of his followers, and only a very small entourage of people came out with him slowly, uh, and basically start the movement again, build up a body of Hasidim that he has lost. Before uh, I come to his period in Poland, which is where this takes place, uh, he uh, goes, uh, while still resident in Riga, uh, he goes on a journey, lasts for about a year, to the Holy Land and then to America. He visits several places in the East Coast where there were some concentrations of his Hasidim. And there he's shocked by what he sees because the younger generation are no longer eating kosher, no longer keeping Shabbat. They are, he's talking to former Chabad families, families he knew, people who had immigrated from the 1880s on and settled in America. The elderly are still connected to the tradition, the younger generation are abandoning it. So in his attempt to halt this, uh, uh, move away from uh, rabbinic tradition and observance, he founds uh, several associates, he calls, he appeals to women. Again, for the first time ever in Hasidism, a rebbe has an address to women, seeing them as a constituency. This is the wives and the daughters of the Hasidim throughout his reign. That's how he refers to them. Calling upon them, first of all, to found associations for the preservation of what he calls purity, purity of the family. And that is uh, the observance of the uh, law that requires women to bathe ritually in the mikveh uh, uh, at the appropriate time during the menstrual cycle. Um, this had been neglected, abandoned, and he appeals specifically to women. His letters are addressed to women, and he has them translated to Yiddish and to English to make sure that they would be able to understand it, calling on them, saying, it is your responsibility. You should mobilize other women. You should raise the funds. You should supervise the construction of mikvehs. So an appeal to women for the first time, although I must say that he's not the only leader in the Orthodox world generally, who is beginning to wake up to the fact that during this period of crisis, when orthodoxy is very threatened, when people are leaving in droves, that the women are a half of their constituency, a resource, a human resource, which has never been tapped. And so then he's not the only one. He's the only one, as far as I know, within the Hasidic camp. But for example, a very prominent uh, figure in the Orthodox world from the Litvak side, from the Mitnagdic Litvak side, non-Hasidic, the Hafez Chaim does the same. He famously gives a sermon to women only when the men are not in the synagogue or the women are sitting down below, although apparently some men were hiding in the women's gallery to listen, and appeals to them in much the same way, also purity of the family. So there is a certain waking up uh, by a very threatened leadership of orthodoxy within Hasidism very prominently in Chabad uh, to the possibility of tapping the resource of women that they had ignored up until now. This is followed in his case by an even more radical innovation, although remi remaining very limited, uh, he begins, in response to a particular initiative in inquiry by one woman, he begins to allow and even encourage the dissemination of mystical Chabad teachings to women, unheard of. You know, we do have, by this period in the interwar years, Beit Yaakov schools, also emerging, dealing with Jewish education for women, for which there was uh, a growing awareness, there was a lack. Uh, which was weakening Judaism. So Beit Yaakov schools also emerging from a Hasidic background and with the sanction from the Hasidic leadership in Poland uh, are teaching women, uh, girls, uh, a certain repertoire of classical normative uh, Jewish texts. But even though uh, the, the, the Beit Yaakov system was founded by a woman who was connected to Hasidism, there's no inkling of any Hasidic teachings in the syllabus. They're not being taught uh, mystical teachings of Hasidism. 
Chabad does that in a limited way, uh, but nevertheless, at first under strict supervision by men, uh, eventually uh, the uh, sixth and more founds a society of the sisters of the Tmimim. Tmimim are the students of the yeshiva, Tumchei Tmimim. Uh, and alongside it, the brothers of the Tmimim. And these were associations encouraging people who were not full-time students at the yeshiva, who were working or doing other things in the world during the day, to meet several times a week uh, in the evenings in order to study some of the sermons and teachings of the Chabad leaders and bits of the Tanya. Tanya is already used, a book, the one book by Shnel Zaman of Ladi, very famously the one that is the text being taught everywhere. Finally, I have to skip uh, uh, much of the material uh, and conclude with the radicalization of this original revaluation of women that takes place at the time of the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe by just saying briefly that the last Lubavitcher Rebbe really took it to the greatest extreme. He, for example, founded uh, one of the first things he did when he became Rebbe in 1950 uh, following the death of 51, following the death of the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, already in New York, uh, he fled from occupied Poland in 1940 <coughs> and established the court, shifted the court to uh, New York. Lubavitch, incidentally, I meant to explain, is the name of the town where the dynasty settled after the Napoleonic War and where throughout the 19th century, until the First World War, the court was founded. It's the name of a town in Rysen, in the same region. So that's why it's called Chabad in Lubavitch after the name of the town. So he moved the Lubavitch court to New York. And uh, the, his successor, the last Lubavitch Rebbe, uh, on one of the first initiatives he took when he became Rebbe himself, was to found the Association of Chabad Women. And to me, very conspicuously, whereas his predecessor, who was the first one to appeal to women, referred to them consistently as the wives and daughters of the Hasidim, the wives and daughters of the Hasidim, he changed it to the women, the women and the, I, I mean, the, the, the Hebrew name is Agudat Neshe Uvnot Chabad. Now, Hebrew uh, terms for both Nashim, women, and banot, daughters, girls are ambiguous. Banot can be either daughters or young girls, and nashim can be either wives or women. But in all the English versions and other languages in which the name of this Women's Association of Chabad appears, they're never called the wives and the daughters. They're called the women and the girls of Chabad. And it, I think it was a very symbolic uh, change that actually made it clear that women are now part of the constituency, and a full-fledged uh, part. And no doubt, uh, Chabad women in, uh, during the time of the last Rebbe and to this day completely take for granted the fact that they are Hasidim. Of course they are Hasidim. They are female Hasidim, just like me. Uh, I don't have time to uh, give you any more about it, although the material document documented it is, is very interesting. But I'll move quickly to the second issue, uh, which is uh, Oh, God. Um, I'm going to exceed my time, so I'll, I'll run through. How, how many... Uh, when, when would you like me to stop? Just go ahead. Now? No. <laughs> I'm looking at my watch. It's... Uh, you have minimal 25 minutes. Okay, I'll be okay. So the second area which I would like to look at from this perspective in which there's been a reinvention, a complete break from the older tradition that launched what we know today as Chabad, is the outreach policy. Um, now, Chabad wrote from the very beginning, already at the time of Rupshnel Zalman, could be said to have been one of the few and perhaps the most uh, committed to, through the temperament and the choices of its founder, Shnel Zalman of Ladi, to a kind of a communications ethos. In other words, Shnel Zalman of Ladi was a Hasidic leader who gave Torah, who taught Torah, who taught Hasidic Torah, who gave sermons which contained speculative thinking in Kabbalistic terms about issues that other Hasidic leaders uh, hardly ever shared with their uh, followers or perhaps never even entertained because there was a tremendous variety of Hasidic leaders. Some were much more prone to uh, speculative thinking, uh, much more adept in Kabbalistic literature and Kabbalistic tradition, much more uh, kind of educative in their approach to their community of followers. 
Others were charismatic leaders who were more magicians. I mean, people who could perform miracles, who could give blessings that would change things in the physical world, blessings that would secure health, uh, fertility, uh, business success, and so on, and did very little else. They were equally venerated. Uh, their movement, their gestures, their personalities, their bodies were considered worthy of observation as some kind of a holy manifestation of the holy on earth. But some of them taught and others didn't teach. Schneur Zalman of Radi is one of those who taught and taught a lot. And at the point at which he began to feel that he couldn't cope with the numbers of people coming to his court to listen to him on a regular basis, he produced, again, a unique thing, certainly in his day, and to this day almost unique, a book that he planned as a book that had a structure, chapters, which was meant to contain the teaching he wanted to convey to people who couldn't actually be present on a regular basis and listen to his teaching. Uh, this is very different to, from most, the far by far the majority of books of Hasidic teachings that we have, which tend to be uh, uh, transcriptions by disciples who listen to the oral delivery of a sermon, which are at the same time, these transcriptions are not only attempts to capture the words, but also translations, because the sermon, the language of discourse, would be Yiddish. A lot of Hebrew and Aramaic quotations from the sources, but the whole discourse would be in Yiddish. But there is a, tra a long tradition that predates Hasidism, whereby you don't publish, you don't publish sacred texts or texts about Torah in any language other than Hebrew. And so the, the act of transcription contained at the same time translation. So they would hear it in Yiddish, they would write it in Hebrew. So that's already two steps removed from what was actually said orally. And then the Hasidic leaders themselves very rarely had the slightest interest in publishing their texts. Many of the books that are considered classics uh, on the shelf of Hasidic literature were actually uh, produced in print many years after the death of their authors by descendants of disciples who had quite often they're very poorly edited. Uh, you have three or four or seven different transcripts of the same sermon, and the per person putting it all together may not be aware of it that he's actually putting four or five different versions of the same thing next to each other, sometimes with contradictions. That's the general picture. Schneur Zaman of Ladi, the founder of Chabad, is unique in having conceived of and produced this coherent book with a clear structure, which was used as a means of introducing followers to his teaching. Moreover, this was controversial in its day. He was attacked by a fellow Hasidic leader, a contemporary, an acquaintance, uh, slightly older than him, uh, for uh, breaking the bounds of esotericism that Kabbalistic texts normally are subject to. What is this? You're publishing a book in which you are offering Kabbalistic terms, Kabbalistic concepts that anybody can pick up in a book and read. A Hasidic leader who felt that it was inappropriate to circulate widely the kind of teachings that Schneur Zaman was offering to his followers. So Chabad is distinct, distinguished by this trend, by communication, and this was elaborated further and further as the generations in the, in the next, in the succession of the leaders. Each one of them contributed uh, to this growing and large body of speculative teachings that were disseminated and published and circulated, uh, and Chabad were very proud of that. Now, um, outreach, the attempt to offer what Chabad has to offer to uh, out to people on the outside world is a concept that therefore exists right from the beginning. But what changes in a, uh, is what the definition of out is. And there's a very beautiful article by my colleague and friend uh, Naftali Lowenthal who traces the evolution of the concept of outwards, uh, particularly in connection with a phrase which is used nowadays, it has been for a long time now, used as a slogan for outreach. May your springs or your fountains gush spread outwards. It is a, uh, a phrase that originally comes from the Hebrew Bible, uh, was used in a Talmud in a particular context of an encounter by one of the Talmudic sages with the Messiah, and is reproduced by the Baal Shem Tov in one of the few 
probably authentic letters we have from him. He never wrote anything, but there is a few, a small cluster of letters. Uh, he himself has an ascent of the soul. He goes up to heaven, he encounters the Messiah, and he impatiently asks him, when are you coming? When, sir, are you coming? And the Messiah says, when your fountains, using this verse, quoting this verse, when your fountains gush outwards. This has become outreach slogan in Chabad, together with Ufaratsta, you know, these are the phrases, the catchphrases one hears. Now, as Tali Leontar has shown, the first person to use this phrase uh, in that sense as a slogan for outreach is the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe. Even though nowadays people assume that this is from the Baal Shem Tov on, the Baal Shem Tov, if you read that letter, in fact, didn't mean outreach at all. In fact, he would like to have had outreach, but the Messiah, unfortunately, then tells him he understands for the Messiah. This will take a very long time. There's no chance that you would witness it. You know, and then there's an alternative method by all kinds of magical procedures. It's not an outreach slogan in its original context, but it becomes that in the language of the uh, Sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe. Now, the Sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, as already intimated, is the one who becomes an exile. He leaves the Soviet Union, he escapes the Soviet Union, and eventually settles in Poland. He chooses Poland, even though his disciples and followers, the few he meets in America, are trying to convince him to move there as a safe haven. Uh, at a time when Europe in the 19 late 20s, in the 30s, Europe is already preparing for the Holocaust. I mean, anti-Semitism is intensified. Uh, the situation economically is critical. Jews are in a very bad way all over. And the sixth Admor is considering the situation and rejects America because he says this is a land of materiality. It is a land of secularism. It will be the end of Judaism there. Soviet Union has made Russia, with a huge Jewish population, the end of Judaism for him as well. Poland is the future. Poland at that time really enjoys a period of relative, uh, well, it is, it is the Second Polish Republic. It is the first time after years of uh, political suppression by Russia, it gains independence. It is given extra territories in bits of Lithuania and Volhynia uh, that uh, from, uh, as a result uh, of the re drawing of the map of Europe after the First World War. It is a country where there is freedom of religious observance. And above all, there's a huge Jewish population, still largely very orthodox. Uh, uh, a lot of Hasidic uh, uh, schools there as well. So the future must lie there. And he chooses to move to Poland. Clearly, he believes that this is where he would stay permanently. Uh, tragically, this is 1933, you know, when he makes this choice. And he arrives in Warsaw, which is densely populated by other Hasidic groups, many of them larger, much larger than the small group that he's managed to bring over with him, or the few. He had already, very with foresight, he had opened uh, what becomes the main Lubavitch Yeshiva, the Tomchet Mimim Yeshiva, which was closed down by the Soviets. They closed down the last branch, of, and all the branches, the small branches, were completely dismantled. So he moves it to Warsaw as early as 1921. And there is a stream of people who go to study there. So there is already a body of graduates of Tomchet Mimim Warsaw. And so there's a small community of Chabad Hasidim who had immigrated to Poland earlier on, since the end of the 19th century, during the First World War. There is a small community, but it is nothing compared to the huge number, wealth and political clout of Ger Hasidim, Alexander Hasidim, Vishnu. That is at least another 50, if not more, different Hasidic courts of varying sizes and influence. So this is a very strange situation for the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He was, I mean, Lubavitch enjoyed for the whole of the 19th century, I would say, splendid isolation. They were very successful. They controlled huge tranches of territory. They had large Hasidic followers, large groups of Hasidic followers. And they had very little competition from other Hasidic groups. Uh, there were a few that were close to their own territories, but they were not as powerful, as strong, as large as them. So Chabad is. You know, the, the Chabad, the Lubavitch Rebbe was used to being king. Moreover, during his period of heroic struggles under the Soviets to preserve Jewish 
orthodoxy, to provide matzot for Pesach to people, to send uh, ritual slaughterers, to send Hebrew circumcisers to communities which had been cut off from any kind of religious services. He became internationally known as a hero. He was very good at, he got support from various uh, Jewish uh, funding organizations abroad. He was a hero um, and very well known internationally and was used to being that. He suddenly arrives in Warsaw. Nobody knows him. There are lots of other Hasidic leaders who are kings in their place. The Hasidim there, you know, even even if you speak, you think of Yiddish, they, they speak different Yiddish. You know, they speak with a different accent, a different dialect. They're not immediately understood, you know, they need to, be, to communicate, they have to make an adjustment. The, the, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, embarks on a program of outreach which is basically designed to steal Hasidim from other Hasidic courts, to go and convince people that Chabad has something worthwhile to offer. He trains his graduates of the yeshiva to go out, and we have amazing correspondence in which you can see the details he gives them, how to go about it. You know, he develops strategies for outreach activity. Go uh, to the various shtiblach, yeshivat, you know, of the other Hasidim, the Hasidim group, negotiate a slot where your, one of your bright young graduates of the yeshiva or students of the yeshiva can come and teach Tanya for a half an hour, or where he can come and read, you know, and discuss some teachings, mamarim, some discourses of the last Rebbe. He tells them, these are Polish Hasidim. They have their own culture, their own tradition. They're not used to long, elaborate, speculative teachings like we Chabad. Tell them stories. They like stories. Indeed, this is exactly the period where part of the same reinvention and outreach activity, he begins to generate stories about the old Chabad leaders, about the old Chabad Hasidim, about the history of Hasidim. These are halfway between kind of history, they look like history, and hagiography tales of holy lives. And he advises his missionaries, the people he sends out, emissaries, to the, to the other places, to offer the Polish Hasidim the sort of thing that they're more attuned to. He also tells them, don't ever talk for longer than you know, half an hour. Don't boast. Don't start this thing, our Rebbe is greater than your Rebbe. Don't, don't engage in this kind of thing. Don't antagonize. This is very good modern kind of penetration techniques. You know, you neutralize possible opposition from the start, and you ensure the greatest receptivity to your message. Very ingenious. At the same time, he also sends uh, emissaries, not just to other Hasidic courts, but to the Litvak Yeshiva, particularly in the territories that now are part of Poland, in Lithuania uh, and Volhynia. There are quite a lot of small and large uh, traditional anti-Hasidic, you know, the Litvak, the, the Mitnad, this is the opposition to Hasidism when it first emerges. This is the other strand. He sends, uh, we have the correspondence he has with one particular uh, uh, very young man, uh, one of his own products of, of the yeshiva, Shneo Zalman Gu Aryeh, and the correspondence there is extraordinary. He sends him out, he says, go and register in all these yeshivot for four months each. Put, you know, look around and spot the brightest iluyim, the most talented yeshiva students. In Talmudic, these are yeshivot that are not Hasidic, they study Talmud. Spot the brightest ones and try to engage with them. And try basically to seduce them to come to Warsaw and study the Lubavitch yeshiva instead. And he has some successes. I mean, we know from the memoirs of people who had been through this that there were a considerable number of people studying in the Lubavitch Yeshiva in Warsaw. There are some lists of students that they have published uh, from which it's very interesting to see. They, the lists that I've looked at contain, uh, not all of them, but uh, some contain information about the name of the student, his age, the, his shiucho hamiflagti in Hebrew, his party affiliation, namely which Hasidic school does he belong to, which Hasidic group does he come from, uh, what does his father do, and so on. So looking at that, you know, most of them, by far most of them, are in one list I think there were only two who were traditional Lubavitch families 
All the others were Go, Alexander, Vizhnish, Suhachrov, Kotsk, you know, lists of all the other. So they're getting Hasidim from other courts to come and study there. In one of them, there were none who were actually Chabad by birth. So he's recruiting a new, he's rebuilding a Hasidic following with some success. When we look at what he achieved, you know, and he even has the imagination to chase after some bright young youngsters of Chabad families who, as he heard, have gone to study in universities abroad. And there are some letters in which it is clear he's appointing some of his emissaries who are traveling to try and locate a Chabad student in Bern at the university, somebody in New York, somebody in Paris, somebody in Oxford. So as far as that, these are minute numbers, only very few. I'm saying that in order to stress that at this stage, the outwards, you know, the, the kind of the outreach is aimed at an outwards, which is still predominantly orthodox, or recently orthodox, people who are falling out, but who belong, first generation of people who are stepping away, going to university. It's a small proportion. Most of them are still very orthodox, just belong to other Hasidic groups. He's not yet aiming at the secularists. This is the radical step taken by the last Lubavitcher Rebbe uh, in New York, who extends the outwards to cover even completely alienated Jews who have had nothing to do with religious tradition, who don't know anything. Uh, and as you know, and I'll say least at all about that, because that is the reality that I think most of you would be familiar with, where Chabad houses in Timbuktu, in, in Tibet, in, you know, where there are emissaries going out to catch Israeli backpack travelers, you know, who have never set foot in a synagogue, who don't know what Shabbat means. Who, and, you know, and the, and, and the idea is that we go out in order to bring in and we don't need to bring in totally. Every little gesture is fine. Every mitzvah, a single occasion when a man lays to fill in, even if he never does it again and doesn't believe in it, is something, is a step in the right direction. There is no demand for total commitment. Uh, and that's why it's very difficult to gauge how many Chabadniks there are. You know, by some counts, there are millions of them. By others, it's much smaller. We just don't know but that they are very conspicuous and very uh, successful, even after the death of the last Rebbe, uh, and that I'll come to now with Messianism. I have to uh, move ahead finally. Now, Messianic teachings in Chabad, in Hasidism generally, there's a conventional view uh, that I think I subscribe to, basically, uh, whereby the Messianic idea is present in the Hasidic doctrine, uh, as it is present in virtually every other branch of Jewish literature or Jewish thought. But it never becomes, oh God, it never becomes in Hasidism a kind of an active, acute, or hardly ever becomes acutely uh, prominent, advocated as something that is about to happen now, and therefore everything we do should be channeled towards it. There are a few such eruptions of active messianic agitation here and there, but generally the picture is much calmer. Yeah, the Messiah would come at some point. The main arena for action and the main concern is this world, as we know it, the world of exile which we inhabit. And I think that can be said of Schnell Zalman, the founder, and of most of his descendants up to the beginning of the 20th century, the turn of the 19th and 20th century. The first one, uh, of the Chabad leaders to adopt a very active messianic rhetoric is uh, the Rashab, Shalom Dov Bel, uh, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, the one who dies in 1920. And he reads the political chaos around him, culminating in the First World War, the Russian Revolution, but beginning earlier with the pogroms, with the mass migration, with the world is collapsing, the world as we know it. And there is a long tradition, a rabbinic tradition, whereby the period immediately preceding the messianic advent would be the worst imaginable. There would be a fall to a kind of an abyss of ignorance and sin and, and destruction, the like of which there had never been, from which 
the messianic redemption would emerge. And he reads the events of his the political events uh, of his own time and processes within the Jewish community in response as the pangs of the Messiah, the birth pains of the Messiah, the suffering that precedes the Messianic advent. He is particularly keen to uh, counter the Zionist vision, which he denounces as a heretical, secularized, messianic, a false messianic vision. He's very combative, so his language, his rhetoric is very militant against the, the false messianism of uh, the Zionists, and he preaches a, a religious uh, observant um, redemption that would be uh, arrived at through the founding of the Lubavitch Yeshiva, the spreading of the teaching through this cadre of vanguard of Hasidic agitators. So he has a lot of messianic rhetoric that is a response to political events in his own day. Um, his successor, Yosef Itzhak, the, uh, the one who moves to Poland and eventually flees to the United States, uh, he goes along even more with the reading of the catastrophic events that follow one after the other. Uh, culminating in the Holocaust as really the culmination of the suffering that would precede the Messianic Advent. He argues that the Messianic Advent is dependent on redemption, uh, on, uh, sorry, on repentance. In other words, the Messiah is around the corner, literally around the corner. The world has sunk to this level of uh, uh, evil and uh, uh, destruction, uh, that the Messiah is literally around the corner, but unless there is mass repentance, and for him repentance means return to orthodoxy, he would not come and the world would sink further into chaos. He evolves a, a kind of a, a language marked by the slogan, uh, uh, immediate repentance, immediate redemption. The condition for redemption is repentance. Uh, and he uses the phrase lealtali geula time and again in slogans everywhere. In the publications he generates already in New York. He starts in Poland, but then he, when he arrives in New York, he immediately sets up, he establishes the publishing house of Chabad Kihot. He establishes various other organs of uh, publicity. Uh, he had begun that already in the 30s in Poland by publishing a journal. And the message is the Messiah, the Messianic Advent is imminent, uh, uh, but it entirely depends on repentance. If the Jews do not repent, and he warns American Jewry when he's in the States, don't put your trust in the Allies during the war. Uh, he, in fact, I think he believed that there's a very serious chance that the Allies would be defeated. He calls the Mishenet Kanel Tzutz, using a famous uh, quote from Isaiah, but uh, condemning the reliance on the big powers of the day the Israelites were constantly uh, uh, committing. Uh, don't rely on them. The only salvation will come from God, and, dip, and repentance is the prerequisite for it. So he, he creates a whole network of of, of emissaries, uh, he creates an organization that sends people out, uses women also as emissaries to households which are known to be slipping from orthodox observance and trying to bring them back in. Uh, he desperately tries to, and to, to achieve a kind of a huge public movement of uh, return to orthodox religion. When the war is over and his prophecies are proved false, the Allies did win and the Messiah <laughs> did not come, the public rhetoric subsides. The journal in which he published these calls for repentance ceases publication. And the messianic teaching continues within his discourses to the intimate group of his followers when he delivered his teachings, but is no longer the public slogan, the public face of Chabad as it was during the 30s and 40s. When he dies, uh, his uh, successor is best known, of course, for A, for apparently claiming, although he never did, but his followers believing that he is the Messiah. At the time of his predecessor, of the sixth rabbi, this was not 
an issue. He was not advocating and was not celebrated himself, although Hasidim may have thought that he is the Messiah. But this kind of uh, attra- this was uh, attached to the sixth Lubav- to the last Lubavitcher Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneelson, uh, increasingly during his uh, uh, reign. Uh, and although he never once said, "I am that," it is generally felt that he allowed his Hasidim to feel that. Now, I don't have time and I don't propose to actually go into what I believe is the nature of his messianic vision. Uh, What is clear is that it was not a kind of an expectation of a sudden, complete transformation of the world as we know it, whereby, uh, you know, trees would stop growing up, would start growing down, you know, the seas would dry up, no physical change. He has a kind of a version of the... Uh, basically the Maimonidean vision of the redemption, which is Olam Kemin Hagon Noheg, the world will continue to conduct itself as it normally does. What there would be would be a great expansion of, for Maimonides, of the intellect, of the way of understanding rationally. And for him, it is a kind of a, a manifestation of the divinity in the material world, even in its most base and vulgar and mundane uh, expressions, uh, which is basically a process and not an event, and which is something which has already begun, which is why he could say that we are living in messianic time and will go on because it is really beyond the dimensions of time and place. But regardless of how I would like to understand his messianic vision, it is clear that he has managed to instill in huge populations, the belief that it is really about to happen and that he is the one who is going to do it. And to this day, there's a faction within Chabad that believes that he is and was the Messiah, that he hasn't died, that he has just moved on to another plane of existence that is invisible to us at the moment, but he will reappear and complete his task. And Chabad Chabad is divided over this. One could only say, in order to conclude, to distinguish his language of messianism from the language of his two predecessors, both of whom were responding to catastrophic events, to a situation which was really very, very difficult politically and uh, in terms of Jewish uh, uh, expectation of Jewish survival, of Jewish orthodox survival. Uh, everything seemed to be b- breaking down. To be, What has happened at his period is that as uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the uh, the also controversial monograph by two scholars by Sam Heilman and uh, Menachem Friedman the Rebbe um, a book which tries to analyze they're both sociologists and they're trying to analyze the sociologically the phenomenon of Chabad the success of Chabad uh, as an outreach movement as a woman the, all these aspects uh, in the period of the last Lubavitcher Rebbe. And they say, and I think rightly, that there is a distinctly positive uh, tone to the last Lubavitcher Rebbe's view of the messianic event. It is a messianism of prosperity, of success, not a messianism of catastrophe and collapse and breakdown and suffering. I mean, in the language of the previous two, there is suffering very much. The sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe speaks about the suffering as a kind of a great fire that would purge the world of evil, you know, and there would be victims, you know, the world would undergo a purging, and evil would have to be subdued. In the case of the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, he uses time and again the phrase that the messianic uh, redemption would be, that evil would not be subdued, it will be transformed. It will be transformed into gold. It is the uh, itapra, not the itkafia, uh, is the, the Aramaic phrase he uses. Uh, it is a view of success which is nourished by the reality that he operates in the United States, in which, particularly with conservative presidents, he manages to forge very good relationship. He's very much attuned to various Reaganite gestures. You know, the place of religion in American society coincides with what he believes, the moment of silence. He loved that. He had a very high profile in the United States and in the world at large as a, as a person of substance, as a leader who has to be. Uh, so he's not escaping persecution as the previous 
one was in Soviet Russia. He's not an anonymous person trying to reinvent a group of people around him. He's a mainline dominant figure recognized by the political authorities with a tremendous, and he globalizes the movement. And again, it is uh, no coincidence that Chabad becomes a global international movement during this era of globalization. He has no worry about using technology. His predecessor also, the ethos of communication legitimates the use of modern technology, the internet, no problem from the start, unlike other Hasidic groups that tend to shun these techniques, they embrace them. So altogether, there's a kind of a, a positive view of the state of the world, which is only progressing towards greater and greater improvement. A reading of political events in Israel, for example, which are considered to be manifestations of the growing presence of the divine in the material world. The Six Day War gave it a boost, you know, it was a miraculous success. Uh, subsequent Israeli military successes were celebrated in that way and can be seen and have been pointed out by some as distinct stages in which the tone of the messianic uh, teaching was uh, stepped up time and time again. So altogether, it is a kind of messianism that could only have grown in the conditions in which it found itself in uh, late 20th uh, century uh, America. Okay. Thank you.